All right. Well, you know what? Let's uh, let's kick this off and uh, and get things started here uh, for today. Uh, it is the top of the hour here, so welcome everyone to the uh, the September edition of the Vancouver Power BI Modern Excel User Group Meetup. Um, so let me just uh, dive right in here. Uh, today we are going to be um, welcoming Miguel Escobar to the program in uh, in a little while here. But first, we've got uh, what's new in Power BI coming up with uh, with my good friend Joseph here. Uh, so before we start, I just want to throw out a big thanks to the sponsors that make this possible. Uh, Skillwave Training, which is uh, my training company, uh, where we like to think that we are the best people to plan on teaching you how to use Excel and Power Query and DAX and Power BI and all kinds of good tools like that. If you are interested in some uh, good training options to really level up your game, you should definitely check us out. Uh, Excel Guru is my main company and Monkey Tools is the product that we put out to help uh, people build better business intelligence models faster inside Excel and help audit those as well as uh, your Power BI models. Uh, if you haven't checked that out, you should as well. Um, our next Excel meetups or our next meetups that are coming up. Um, on October 6th, I am actually going to be doing a meetup. Uh, it's my turn to do this again. We're going to be looking at uh, building Excel business intelligence models with monkey tools. I realize it's been about three years since I've actually done a session uh, showing you uh, all my uh, my tool set that I work with here. So this is uh, all about building um, no code, low code models uh, for um, Power Pivot and Power Query and things like that. So if you haven't actually seen monkey tools uh, in progress, I really hope that you'll uh, you'll come and check that out. Uh, for our next Power BI track, uh, we are going to be starting late. We're going to be doing a, a 9 p.m. kickoff on the West Coast. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, Chandeep Chabra is joining us from Dubai, and he's going to be sharing some cool M tricks in Power Query. Uh, can't wait to see that. You can ne never really get enough Power Query, can you? So um, don't uh, don't forget to uh, to sign up for that one as well. Um, should be a good time. Um, to let you know, the next semester of my self-service business intelligence bootcamp has just opened for registration here. We actually have two options uh, running right now. So if you prefer to be uh, doing the online thing, we're kicking off a new semester on October 19th. Uh, you can even get a $200 uh, discount uh, when you sign up using the SSBI uh, 1022 code down the bottom there. Uh, if you sign up before uh, September 25th, of course. Um, the other option is if you prefer to do things in person, we're going to be doing this as a live on-site boot camp in Auckland, New Zealand uh, on November 30th through December 2nd. This is going to be a Definity post-con session. So there's a fantastic conference coming up for a couple of days. And then this uh, workshop where we're going to spend three days uh, doing a lot of this work as well. Um, in addition, if you do register for the in-person uh, boot camps there, you get access to all of the online material as well. So uh, definitely uh, worth checking out um, along the way here. Uh, to let you know, the re meetup recordings are all hosted on our SkillWave YouTube channel. I usually get these posted most of the time within 24 to 48 hours after things are done. Sometimes it takes a reminder in the meetup chat in order to get me to get that one through. Apologies for that for last time, folks. Um, but uh, we will uh, always post in the... Um, in the meetup group once the uh, once the video is live. So uh, don't worry, we will have a recording of this in a couple of days. Uh, just a quick reminder, if you like your uh, bite size uh, power query and other knowledge here, um, we have our Monkey Shorts free weekly videos hosted on our Stillwave YouTube channel as well. Uh, the link for Monkey Shorts is down at the bottom there and I'll drop this into the chat in a little bit here as well. Uh, today's episode was about adding slicers to cube formulas and we actually have been uh, running a few different cube formula um, type stuff over the last uh, few weeks. So there's just the last three and there are, I think there's about 36 episodes posted or something like that, about 38 done uh, so far. So um, I've actually been surprised I've been able to, to carry it as long as I have here, which is uh, pretty cool. Um, <laughs> Last thing that I want to say before I throw this over to Joseph here is that uh, if you would like to come and do a presentation for us, we love new speakers. All you need to do is fill out this form, tell us who you are and what you want to talk about. We will get in touch and uh, and get you onto our show here. Uh, we've welcomed a few new speakers this year. I always am looking for more. Um, if you would prefer not to do a full presentation, but you would like to try your hand at this, I'm actually really in need right now for our next meetup uh, when uh, Chandeep comes to uh, to town for us. We actually need someone to give us their quick rundown of what's new in Power BI because unfortunately Joseph is not going to be joining us because he's on vacation again. 
well, or something. At any rate, I'm going to give him a hard time that um, the one time a year where he can't actually uh, can't make it for us. So um, if you'd love to come and just do a quick uh, 15 to 20 minute presentation on what's new in Power BI or your favorite features on Power BI, whatever it is, as long as it ties into Power BI and is somewhat current, uh, we would love to uh, to give you a shot there. So just get in touch with us. And on that note, I think my bit here is done. So Joseph, I'm going to uh, turn the uh, the screen or slow down a 10 minute presentation. <laughs> um, <laughs> sure, that works too. Um, or you could try and do uh, our old uh, um, Yana's presentation where she fit like an hour and a half into 10 minutes too, right? I mean, she's yeah. crazy with some of that. Uh, anyhow, yeah. but the floor is yours. And I see oh. Miguel has joined us now. This is good. That means I don't have to be nervous. So that's awesome. <laughs> so we'll uh, uh, we'll have Miguel on in about 15 or 20 minutes when Joseph's done. I, I saw that too. And I was very relieved as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thought you were going to be um, filling a lot of space. To <laughs> totally. <laughs> a slow 10 minute today. Um, yeah. Anyway, th yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ken. Uh, welcome everyone to this month's uh, Power BI, Vancouver Power BI user group. Um, I'm Joseph Yates. I'm going to be doing the What's New in Power BI for September. Uh, the release came out e two two days ago, yesterday. Um, so I've had a few days to to pull together a bit of a demo around some of my favorite new features in Power BI. Uh, but just before I jump into that, just a little bit about me. Um, I have a website and blog, feathersanalytics.com, uh, where I have some some blog posts about really all things Power BI. Uh, a little bit about R as well, and then how we can bring R and Power BI together in some cases. Um, I have a few presentations on integrating R in Power BI, and earlier this year I presented at this meetup group of Python integration in Power BI. Uh, I have a few other presentations from over the last few years, and you can find those all at feathersanalytics.com. Uh, if you want to reach out and connect on Twitter and LinkedIn, my contact details are up on the slide now as well. Uh, always happy to, to connect with the wider analytics community, uh, answer any questions you may have from the session today, um, or just anything about data really, just happy to connect. Uh, but with that, why don't we jump into what's new in Power BI for this month? Uh, so as always, Microsoft Power BI blog um, has a has a monthly blog post that summarizes um, some of the new features from the latest release of the Power BI desktop app. Um, so this month, uh, some of my favorites are in the reporting section, uh, but there have been actually a lot of updates this month in quite a few different areas of Power BI. So we have some new connectors and some updates for existing connectors in the data connectivity and preparation section. We have some great updates in the Power BI service and mobile apps, um, some really cool stuff in embedded analytics, including the Power BI and Jupyter integration updates. Um, this has been delayed until October 2022, but when I started looking at that um, over the last couple of months and looking ahead to October, I think I might need to update my uh, Python and Power BI integration presentation. Uh, and we have some new visualizations as well, some custom visualizations. Uh, but to start, I think let's have a look at the hierarchical axis by default in Power BI. Uh, so if I just jump into my demo Power BI report, uh, actually before I get into the hierarchical axis, uh, one thing that happened with me when I updated to this month's version of, uh, to the September version rather of Power BI, is I got this little warning message. Um, and if I zoom in da -da, here, let's build it up a bit. Uh, so future versions of this application will require a core component to be updated. So we need to make sure that we install Microsoft Edge WebView 2 and activate the preview feature now for the Power BI desktop uh, infrastructure update. Uh, if you're on Office 365, I believe this is being taken care of for you, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, if you're on the if you're on the monthly release uh, updates, if you're on the semi-annual release, I believe that you're okay as well. Um, if anyone wants to correct me, if I'm spewing nonsense, please do step in and correct me. Um, 
Otherwise, this is something that either you or uh, your IT department will just need to monitor and keep an eye on. So I got I got a little bit of a warning. Um, I'm checking this out, so just wanted to call attention to it as well. Uh, for the hierarchical axis by default, um, what that looks like is if we look at um, our line visual here, which actually looks a little bit nicer when it's a bit smaller. Um, actually, yeah, let's go back to that version. Uh, we can see that although we have a continuous axis, right now all of the labels for our x-axis, which is a date, are concatenated by, by default. So I have some hierarchical data in the x-axis. I'm drilled down to a low level, and we're getting these really long descriptive names of the date, like 2019, quarter one, January, 2019, quarter one, February, and so on. And some of the and some of the information that's at like a higher level of the hierarchy is being repeated all along the axis. So we've always had the option to go into the visualizations pane on our X axis, concatenate labels, toggle this off. Um, there are some options as well as if we want it to be like a continuous or a categorical axis, um, depending on the data type that's in there. Uh, and we can see that once we do this, it looks a lot more clean. We don't have the repeating quarters and the repeating years. It might be a little bit easier to read. Uh, and now this is the default behavior um, when we put hierarchical data like dates um, or different types of hierarchical data on the x-axis. Uh, and if I just go back to the blog post here, um, there's actually a nice table of the behavior, what the previous default behavior was, and now what the new default behavior is. Um, so not a huge, not a huge update um, in terms of there's no new functionality, but just the default behavior is a little bit easier uh, and will probably save us some clicks when it comes to setting up uh, certain types of column charts and line charts as well. Uh, my second favorite update from this month is the improved display name for summarized fields. So if I head back into Power BI in my table visual in the bottom right hand corner here, I have um, some, some information from one of my dimensions in the rows of uh, actually a matrix visual, and I have a DAX measure total balance here as well. Uh, but on our fact table, what I can do is if I view hidden items, because I've hidden some of the columns on that table, if I take um, like just our balance field that the total balance measure is based off of and drop it in here, if I hit the drop down on the implicit measure from the values pane um, or the values well, we can see that by default we have a sum of balance. And if I click back onto that column in the fields pane and go up to column tools, we can see this is the default summarization is sum. And when, when I drop this into a visual, it just says that it's balance. But if I change this, default summarization to be average as opposed to sum. Now when it's in the visual, it says sum of balance because that's the type of implicit measure that we've defined in this value as well. If I change this to average though, which matches up with the default aggregation, it just says balance here. So we can have different types of default aggregations for different columns. But those aggregation types can be different and they're not being displayed in our visual. Uh, so to combat this, what we now have the option to do is if we go to options and settings, options. Within the, uh, uh, I, th I think it's in both. Let's see, let's in the current file, if we options, if we scroll down to the bottom for default summarizations, we can click on for aggregated fields, always show the default summarization type. So if I hit OK there, I will need to restart. Um, but if I did restart, now we see that it says average of balance, even though that's the default aggregation. So it just makes it a little bit more clear exactly what's happening within our visuals. And we're not having a sum, an average, a median, a minimum, or different types of aggregations all happening with different columns within our visual, and it's not obvious what's going on. And um, so I would suggest toggling that. I would suggest toggling that on by default. 
We can always override it by using DAX measures anyway, um, but just some behavior change to look out for. Uh, my third favorite feature update from this month uh, is actually an improvement on one of the features that I demoed last month. Um, last month, I looked at this uh, conditional formatting for data labels within visuals. And when I actually built out this conditional formatting of having text appear red if a number was below a certain value and a default color if it was above a certain value, it actually didn't work. Um, there was a bug in the in the feature and now it's it works, which is really nice. So if I click into the uh, the visualizations pane. Under data labels. If I click on doo -doo -doo, where was it color here, if I hit the FX for the formula that I want to do my conditional values on, that's not right. What am I looking at? Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, I don't remember where it was. There are too many. Yeah, was there value? No, not values. Where's labels? I might be looking in the wrong place. Uh, let's do it here. Well, let's build it again. Let's do rules based on not count of date from our fact table. We'll look at total balance. And we'll say if a value is uh, greater than or equal to zero as a number, but less than, and I think I put 17 million last time. Uh, then let's set the text to be, let's change it to something different, maybe an orange. Okay. Did that change anything? I'm not sure. It didn't look like it changed anything to me. OK, so just when I say it was buggy and now it works, I'm not quite sure what's going on. I'll need to take a look at that. But when I was playing around with it earlier, one of the bugs um, had been fixed. Uh, so so just gives us a little bit more options around the formula. Uh, sorry, around conditional formatting and the actual we can control the appearance of additional parts of our visual with formulas, uh, either a rule, with our uh, rule set or with a DAX measure itself. Uh, and my, the last feature, I think there was one more. Do, 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 do. Uh, oh, yeah, the Power BI and the Jupyter Notebook integration. So uh, I was looking forward to this one this month. Unfortunately, it's been delayed until October. Um, but what this what this allows us to do is to bring a Power BI report and actually embed it into a Jupyter Notebook and allow us to work with some of the data from that Power BI report. Uh, so this is Jupyter Notebooks are really common when we're using languages like Python uh, and doing more data science-y things or some markdown documents and the ability to bring Power BI and integrate that directly into a Jupyter Notebook um, is super cool and could potentially be game changing when it comes to sharing our business intelligence or more advanced analytics with our team or, or with our organization. And so definitely keep an eye on this update. I think there are a few videos out there already. Uh, and like I say, I might need to update my uh, Python and Power BI integration based on this update because um, I think this is super cool. Uh, but with that, those were my favorite updates from this month. I'm ready to pass it back to Ken and back to Miguel now uh, to take a look at some super cool things in Power Query. So back to you, Ken. And awesome. uh, yeah, thank you everyone for attending. Thanks very much again for uh, for doing this, Joseph. I really appreciate it. And um, let's see. Hopefully, Miguel, I see your camera's off now. Where did you go, my friend? Hey, um, can you hear me? I can hear you. Fantastic. All right. So. Um, I'm doing really well, man. I'm I'm uh, I'm just you know honestly I'm super stoked that you're here doing this. Um, so I'll tell you what. Why don't we uh, Why don't we let you set up your screen? You can do your your sharing uh, while you're doing that. I'm just going to give uh, people here a, a brief intro to who you are because uh, um, yeah. some people may not know our history. Um, but uh, it actually goes back quite a few years. I I got this weird email out of the blue from some dude that says, Hey, listen, um, I want to write a power query book, and uh, and we're going to do it together. And I said. Okay, 
And next thing I know, I'm uh, I'm working with Miguel on building Power Query courses and writing books and whatever else. And uh, and Miguel was a business partner of mine for uh, for several years, um, even though we'd actually never met in person. And uh, I have actually been trying to get him to come onto the show to uh, to do some Power Query stuff for us for at least two and a half years. And I'm just really really happy that we've finally been able to uh, to make this happen. So. Um, oh, come on. There's got to be at least one person out there, Christian, that doesn't know who Miguel is. So I'm going to let him do the rest of the intro. But, dude, I'm so happy to have you on the show here. It is fantastic to, uh, to hear your voice again. Um, we miss you. I'm glad that you're having fun at Microsoft. Now you can <laughs> tell everybody what you do and, uh, and show us some cool stuff about Power Query. Sure. But the, the, it, it cannot be like two years you, you waiting for an email. Like, that's crazy. No, it has. It's been at least that. At least, no way, and, yeah. I mean, yeah, I was asking you questions. You're like, no, no, I can't really do it right now. And then, then I was like, okay, well, you know, you're going to Microsoft because, of course, I knew this long before everybody else. I'm like, you're coming on my show. No, no, you got to wait until I'm at Microsoft, and we all know that <laughs> took a while. So, yeah, it was at yeah. least two years. <laughs> yeah, uh, but yeah, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, sorry that it took so long. Uh, my name good. is Miguel Miguel Escobar. Uh, cool friends with Ken, of course. Um, I wrote two books with him. I didn't meet him until we started working on the second one. So it was like three years in when we actually started considering actually meeting in person. <laughs> so funny story, but yeah, this is the, the world that we actually live in nowadays. Uh, other facts about me. Um, I joined Microsoft as a product manager for Power Query, um, Valentine's Day of this year. We wanted to make it special. so. Yeah, that, that just symbolizes my love for, for the tool. And previously, I was a Microsoft MVP, and um, I had my own company called Power Solutions. Uh, we were a Microsoft Gold partner uh, in Panama, uh, primarily working on in data analytics and everything that had to do with Power BI. Um, nowadays, I just have my um, my website. My website is the Power User. Uh, that one I blog about pretty much everything that I'm doing might be about uh, technology, it might be about some of about the hobbies that I have, or, uh, all of the other work that I do. Uh, that thing about PAV that you see there, that's actually, uh, yeah, that's actually my my music project. So you can check it out on Spotify and everything else. But uh, we're going to be talking about Power Query today, so let's go with Power Query. And um, so for Anyone, uh, I just want to ask just a general question, but how many people here know about Power Query? I'm hoping that people can just type like one in the chat if you know Power Query. Like, like this is this is Kempel's group, so it should be like a one, like a spam of one. There we go. Good. So Power Query, I'm just going to go super quick on this one. Uh, it's a data preparation tool. Uh, it, is, it was created with the business user in mind. Uh, it has an intuitive interface primarily for the Excel user. It basically originates from that. And it uses a functional language called M. And it has a bunch of connectors, a bunch of transformations, and a lot of product integration. And what I'm about to go over is primarily about how this actually works behind the scenes. And this is something that is not so apparent when you're using the tool. So this is more about, hey, what happens behind the scenes when you're working with Power Query? And when you're working with Power Query, you're effectively creating a script. And the UI helps you create a script. That is scripts uh, basically gets processed by the Power Query engine, and then you get the table or the value that you're actually looking for, that output. So if we wanted to uh, symbolize this into a diagram, we basically have four components. We have the script that the UI, Power Query UI, helps create. We have what is called the Power Query engine, or just it's the Power Query. We have the data source, in this case is the uh, SQL database down here. And then we have the output, which is what we actually need. So what happens is that once you have that uh, a script, that Power Query script or that query, uh, what happens is that we send that to the Power Query engine. The Power Query engine then interprets that and it tries to figure out what it needs to do. It notices that it tries, it needs to actually get data from the data source. So it sends a request uh, for the data from that data source from SQL Server. Then it gets that data 
it processes that data as a step number four, and then it just, yeah, it, it basically outputs that data to a specific destination. Uh, depending on the product integration, it can be, a, it creates a new table in Excel, it might actually load the table directly to Power Pivot, uh, I might actually load the table directly to a lake house if you're actually using uh, one of the data flows integrations in Power Query Online. But uh, we're going to go deeper into this. We're going to keep the same components. But we're going to go deeper into what actually happens inside of the Power Query engine. And here's where things actually get super interesting. So once you have that script, what happens is that uh, it analyzes, Power Query analyzes your script through an engine uh, that you can call it the optimizer engine or the optimizer. And it, some people just call it the query folding capabilities or the query folding mechanism. It determines first what your query needs to do, but at the same time, it tries to request some data from your data source to see what it's capable of doing. So once we understand what your data source is capable of doing within our connector, then we determine what set of instructions from your script we can run locally and which ones we can actually rely on your database or your data source to actually handle. And that is the power of query folding. It's, it's also the push down or push up, depending on your perspective, uh, but it tries to optimize everything that you do in your script so that your data source does most of the uh, coursework or the hard work, basically. And then, um, yeah, so we submit that request in the native uh, query language of your data source. That's a step number four. We get that data and we transform it with the transformations engine or the Power Query engine. And then, yeah, step number seven is just the output. And that's effectively the uh, the concept of uh, query evaluation in, in Power Query. It's, it's relatively simple. Uh, we do have quite a bit of documentation about this. But what I'm going to do today is try to tell you or try to give you a, a few tools on how you can try to understand better how your query works and what are the chances of your opportunities to optimize such queries. So I'm going to change this. I'm going to stop presenting for a while. Just uh, let me stop here because I'm going to have to share again my other screen. Let's see Windows, I have to share. I'm going to go here. So let me know if you can see my screen now. We can, yes. Awesome. So how many of you are using Power Query Online, uh, either Power BI Dataflows or Power Platform Dataflows or anything? Do you even use uh, Dataflows at all, Ken? I have a couple of things in Dataflows, yes. I will not say more at this point in time. Oh, you can on, call man. you can you can call me and we can talk more about that off offline. Oh come on, man! <laughs> you gotta talk. I, I I I have a couple. I just yeah, but we should talk more about uh, about performance later. <laughs> so what I'm gonna be using is the um, uh, the data source that we have in the book. So this little book, I'm super proud of the cover. Uh, Ken can tell you more about how picky I was with how this little monkey actually looked like. But uh, yeah. And uh, funny fact, I actually created this uh, front cover first, the original version of the front cover. <laughs> you remember that one, Ken? I remember you agonizing over that cover, buddy. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah you put a lot of work into that. We had that cover for, um, <laughs> it feels like, like two years before the book got yeah. written. Yep. Yeah. So I'm going to connect to that SQL server. So it's just uh, the server, uh, this database. Uh, and, uh, and then I think that I actually connected to it before, so it just recognizes the credentials that I have. For now, um, it's just about connecting to that data source, to that database. Uh, I shouldn't have any issues. Uh, let's say that I connect to two data sources. So I'm going to connect to our two tables uh, or the detail, and let's connect to the product. So those two, click on transform data, it's going to land those two into the Power Creator. I'm on a Mac, so things might not actually look exactly how they look like to you, but uh, things are actually looking pretty fine for me. So I'm going to change this so that this is close, as close as possible to uh, what you have in the desktop. Uh, do know that we have cooler stuff on the web, so you should totally check that out, like the diagram view. 
But for now, um, yeah, I'm just going to keep it super simple. One of the things that we can do uh, on this one, I think that this is the product. So let's say that, hey, I just want to keep the ones that are red because I really love red stuff. So that's my favorite color. So I'm going to do with red. And I'm going to go with the, uh, I really don't want to spend too much. So let's say that I'm just going to keep the 3499. So I'm just doing two filters and I just figure out that there's only one product that matches those two criteria. If I go to the query settings, I, I just open this. There's one little icon that goes throughout or that actually has this line throughout. Uh, this little thing, it's called the query folding indicator. And what it's telling me is if my step or my query up to that point is actually folding. And uh, it might actually be, you know, a tool for you to check out, hey, is what I'm doing actually something that actually falls back to the data source? Is it going to be completely, you know, handled by the data source or do I have to use the engine that Power Query has to process something? And um, something nice about this, I'm going to show you something, is that besides this tool, which is the query folding indicator, we have something called the query plan. So this query plan, similar to how you actually have a query plan in, let's say, something like Azure Data Explorer, or you have something like SQL Server that they do provide their own uh, query plans, we have a query plan for Power Query. And uh, hey, what you see- Miguel. Can I yeah. can I interrupt you for just a second here? Uh, Sean has asked, but can you give a, a, a basic just a basic description of what the heck is query folding? Sure. So that query folding is basically what we just saw before. Is that optimizing process where Power Query determines what can be sent to your data source as a request of data. In some cases, for example, right now, what we're saying is that we're going to requesting only this data that you're seeing right now. We're not requesting all of the data from the table that we're connecting to. We're only going to be requesting the data that you're currently seeing right now, which is just one row. So that's an optimization right there. We're not trying to just connect to your database and get all of the data you have in that table and then filter that locally in Power Query. Instead, we're saying to that database, only give me this one row of data. That's it. Don't give me more. So it's all about transforming or translating everything that I do in Power Query into something that can be interpreted and requested to the data source. That's effectively Power Query or Query Folding. Let me know if, if you need uh, any other examples. Yeah, I think, I think that hopefully makes some sense. Uh, and then the uh, Charlie's asked if Query Folding only happens when you connect to a SQL database or does it work with other type of connections as well? It works with a lot of connections. It's it's all about the connector and the data source capabilities. But uh, usually we just go, we, we do examples with SQL Server. But uh, I can tell you, for example, um, SharePoint uh, list has uh, query folding. Uh, the SharePoint connector has uh, query folding. Uh, Astro Data Explorer has query folding. Uh, Oracle has some query folding. So there's a lot of uh, all data has query folding. So there's quite a few that have query folding and it's all about the compute engine. Uh, if if you see one uh, data source that, that has some sort of compute engine, it is more than likely capable of, of having some sort of, of query folding. When it's just a storage, like for example, an Excel file, Excel file just has, it's just a file. So there's really no compute on that end when you're connected to a file. Uh, the only computer that you're going to be using is just Power Query, so it doesn't have any sort of query folding capabilities. Same thing with a CSV file, for example. Um, do we have any other questions? Nope, you're good to go. Awesome. So we're going to go with this one, and let's just say that I only want to keep these two columns. So I'm just going to do a remove other columns, and this is still folding, so I can see that it doesn't change anything. It's just saying that this tell this step will be evaluated by the data source. So we're good to go. We can click on this one and it just opens up uh, another one that goes in depth into what are the query folding indicators and what are the indicators that we have available. So we do have quite a bit. There's one for not folding. So I'm going to just force things to not fold. Uh, I'm going to use one operator that I know that it doesn't fold, which is creating an index column. And the moment that I add that, I notice that this one 
will be evaluated outside of the data source. And if I check the query plan, uh, I can see here that I'm going to have the two nodes that I already saw. So the data source and then the value that near the query. And then I, and I have another one that is the table dot add index column. And that one has a different label down here, which is called streaming. So there are two, uh, or there are basically three types of nodes or categories for this. So we have remote streaming, and then we have another one, which is called the uh, full scan. So I'm going to do a sort down here. It's still not going to be folding uh, this one because it's, uh, it has a, a dependency on the previous item. And if I go here, I see that this sort is a full scan. And when it comes down to optimizing your queries, what you're trying to avoid is the ones that are reliant on a full scan. Because the full scan, what it means is that it needs to read your whole table before you can actually uh, do any evaluation. Uh, in terms of the table index, it doesn't have to read the whole table to actually perform uh, anything. So these are the ones that you want to prefer. In some cases, you are it's completely unavoidable to actually use something that requires a full scan. But usually the, the ones that go with streaming uh, run faster, and that's why you get a, a preview that runs or that is evaluated faster than the other ones. I do want to give you one quick tip, and that is that you're not only you can only see you're not able to just see the query plan at one specific step. You can just go into previous step and just check what was the query plan before anything that I did, and you can just see it. Uh, for queries or steps that are fully folding, uh, what's going to happen is that um, <clears throat> you're always going to see just two nodes. You're going to see just the data source and then the value of the native query. And this value of native query is telling me what is actually being uh, sent back to the data source. So this is the actual native query sent to uh, SQL Server. Um, do we have any questions in the chat? Not at this time, nope. So this is effectively those two tools that we have. There are quite a few other things that we can do. Uh, so I'm going to go back to the cell sorted detail. And for this one, let's just say that I'm going to do something quite different. So let's say that I, mm, I'm going to do a sort. I can actually see that this one actually sorts back. So it's sending that uh, native query backed. So again, if it's fully folding, just those two nodes, only the SQL database or the data source and the value of the native query. So it's just saying that uh, it's going to be ordered by the cells already. Super simple. Uh, quantity, let's say that I only want to have the ones that have a one and a six. And I only want to check this two. So I'm going to remove all the little columns. There we go. All the way down, it just folds. And when I go here, I want to merge this with the other table that I have, which is the product table. And I want to merge those two columns using the uh, product ID. So this one, product ID, product ID. And let's say that I'm going to use the right outer. There we go. And there we go. So this is just telling me that I need premium to make this happen. But for now, since we're just testing, we can still make this work. And what you see here in the merge square is uh, you're going to see that the uh, current query plan uh, or yeah, the, the step is telling me that it's not really folding. And uh, what needs to happen here is that it's it's doing the, the full scan on the nested join. So yeah, this is still doing the nested join first, and then it's doing the, the other columns that needs to happen. So what I can do from here, let's say that I'm just going to bring the name. And notice that that one, this operation, the merge queries, it says that it didn't fold. And when I actually expand it, it does fold. So this is something quite unique. Uh, when you don't really expand this, it is not fully going through or it's not actually performing the, the join because this column that you see here is just a virtual column. It's just a pointer. 
it's being basically evaluated until you actually expand it. So once you expand it, you actually see here that it's going to be fully uh, falling back to the data source. So that's a unique case when you're handling uh, merge operations in Power Query. Uh, let's see if we have any anyone with questions around that one. No questions at this point. I, well, actually, no, you know what? I'm going to throw you a question because you got something in this user interface that's not in my desktop. Um, when you're merging those queries, you have a little key icon on some of these columns. What does that mm -hmm. indicate inside uh, inside this area versus, because I mean, we don't have that in desktop. So what is what is that indicator for? Uh, this one is specifically for defining or we're reading that this is a column uh, that could be a key. It could be a primary key or it can actually be a foreign key. So from this one, uh, yeah, this will be a primary key for this table and this will be a foreign key for probably the other order table, I believe. So it's just a way to represent the keys. And if you want to mark a column as a key, you can just go to transform, click on mark as key, and it's going to add the table that key column. So does that indicate then that there's some kind of relationship that's been defined somewhere else that it's reading? Uh, for this one, yeah, when we read it from the data source from the SQL server, yeah, we're basically just reading the metadata and just trying to put the keys uh, as indicators and to give you some cues of, cool. hey, these this are cool. These are, wait, we, we, we don't make the distinction between, hey, which, which one is a primary or a foreign key, but we just tell you that they are being used as keys. Fair enough. Cool. Thanks. Um, any other questions or? Uh, we've got one really, I just a quick question on is Power BI included with Office 365 Home. Um, Sean says he used Power Query in Excel, but hasn't dabbled in Power BI. Uh, Power BI is actually a free download, um, Sean, for the Power BI desktop. Um, so it's actually a different program. Uh, PowerBI.com, like the, the web service that Miguel is using, uh, is something that you would end up, particularly for data flows here, be paying for. So. Um, Hopefully that helps in that area. Um, Joseph is asking, why is the query plan visualized from right to left? Good question. So let's let's try to actually see. Let's see. Let's say that we want to see the uh, SQL query plan. Um, if you try to see the query plan from SQL, uh, it is basically the same thing. It, it is trying to evaluate from uh, the output, which is on the left, and then everything that happened to actually get to that output. So it, it comes from SQL basically. So we're trying to make uh, go towards the standard on how uh, query plans are shown across other products. Uh, and, and that's primarily why you see the query plan from uh, the start, which is the right, to the left, which should be the output at all times. Cool, I think that's it for questions. Yeah. Um, but yes, uh, I think that this this is pretty much all the content that I have. Uh, um, we can try some some really bizarre scenarios if you guys want. Um, and this is around uh, Northwind O data. Um, so there are some specific data sources that have um, yeah that, that are quite unique. One of them being O data. And when you connect to old data, um, the services can actually let's see what's happening here. Um, library resources, just TTP, can actually be there. You go. Uh, it's not letting me. Let's see what's actually happening. You should find an engineer to make those messages understandable, dude. <laughs> Let's see if I can actually see it here. There we go. So it should be anonymous. There might actually be something wrong with my account. Let's try this. Let me see something. Northwind, O data. There's so many URLs for this service. I keep forgetting which one is the right one. Yeah, this is just a redirect. Or maybe I'm having some issues with my internet. There we go. So it should be the this should be the one. SBC one. 
Uh, now I can connect to, let's say that I connect to this too. And um, yeah, so in here, uh, when I connect to customers, for example, let's say that I connect to customers, and I do uh, something similar to what I did before. It's let's say that I uh, filter this one to only have Berlin. And um, when I go to filter rows, notice that there's a different icon. And this one is telling me this step might be evaluated by the data source. Might be. It's, it's not conclusive. And the reason behind that is that one of the first things that happens with that engine, the Power Query engine that I was telling you about, is that it tries to determine what are the capabilities of your data source. With OData, there's, um, yeah, there, there, there are not super reliable ways to figure out that without actually testing something. Um, so that's why you see this called uh, value.alternate because there could be two query plans depending on your data source and what is actually able to uh, fold. In this case, uh, this path, it's telling me that, hey, I can actually fold everything. I can fold everything to just one single call that does have a filter, as you can see here. And it's telling me that the SQL, uh, the CD is equals to Berlin. Uh, the other one, what's happening is that we're just getting the data from the customer's table. And then we're doing the um, the filter or the table dot select rows. Um, yeah, locally. So it, I could do the same with the others. Uh, so let's say that I add, add a new step to just remove all the columns. And if I check the query plan, the query plan is just going to give me another note. And it's going to be the table dot select columns. And it could be, you know, it could, it could potentially be that, let's say that. Um, Everything falls. So this is the first path at the top. Everything simply falls. It says that the CT is equals to Berlin and um, it should only get the customer column or contact name, customer ID, contact name, those two. There could be another path where only the CD filter actually folds and then the table outside the columns runs locally. There could be another one where simply nothing Fold, which is this one. We just get the data from the customer table and then we do the filter and the select of the columns. And uh, yeah, so there's quite a few value of alternate paths that we can have. Miguel, um, presumably in this case, the reason why you're putting this up or why the, the query plan will be uh, would be throwing this out is because it doesn't know for sure when it tries to execute the entire thing, which of these paths is going to be followed. Yeah. Is that correct? Okay. So. Is there ever a point where this changes, where once you've done a refresh, it comes back and says, this is the path that I did choose? So that's what we call the execution plan. When we know for sure what was uh, what was the path that we actually chose when we executed something. But what we're seeing at the moment is the estimated query plan, which is uh, just just based on uh, static analysis of your of, of your query, basically. So we just imagine that we just read the, the administrator. We figure out what are the steps that you have. We transform that into the nodes that we that we have down here. And we just give you like, hey, what are the possibilities based on your data source and the functions that you're using? But uh, we don't really run too many test codes to figure out which is the, the path that needs to be taken. Because in order to do that, we will have to run the full the full query. Yeah, I guess the reason why I'm asking though is that you know for from a performance standpoint for for somebody who's working on one of these things where they're finding it really slow it'd be really really useful to be able to actually get a report back that says afterwards okay here's what the query plan was here's what actually got executed so that we actually have an idea as to which path did it take and is there is there a reason right because in some cases you I mean I've seen in some cases where just changing the data type on a column actually breaks query folding I mean, that would be an interesting thing to be able to identify is that something like that has happened. Maybe I can actually change some things up to get a different query path going through next time around. So from a debugging perspective, I think it'd be handy if you could actually give us something after it's run to give us a result to say this is the path that was chosen, just as a, as a feature suggestion. Yeah, I think that, you know, for any sort of uh, feature suggestions, uh, we do rely heavily on the ideas of PowerVA.com. So if anyone has any uh, ideas uh, or, or you see a value in the execution plan, um, I don't think that we have any any ideas around the, the correct execution plan, but that will be uh, the place, this will be the best place to actually post that idea. Uh, and this is kind of the reason why I'm I'm doing this sort of 
uh, yeah, sessions. So you guys can see what we have available today. And if you think that there's something of value um, that you think that we should be working on, yeah, uh, like the execution plan, that would be great for you to to let us know through the IDS Power BI site. Bring it to desktop, <clears throat> you know, <laughs> this is <the> standard. <laughs> um, hey, so listen, we do have some questions uh, that have been uh, um, been uh, stacking up in the queue right now. So uh, I'm going to take them a little bit out of order. Um, Solar is asking, what's the difference between a query plan and query dependency? So the query dependencies is uh, the predecessor. You can say that's that way, but uh, it has the, the the dependencies view uh, that you have in um, in desktop. The query dependencies is more in line with what we have for the diagram view because it, it shows you the queries. The query plan is more about how uh, your query will be evaluated by the Power Query engine. So it might not might not actually have all, all of your steps, you might actually have just the steps that were going to be evaluated or the functions within those steps and, and we transform that into the nodes and exactly what's going to be uh, evaluated by Power Query. So what you see in, in the desktop uh, is the uh, dependencies, view. The dependencies view is basically the diagram view. It's just that the diagram view goes from left to right. The dependencies view uh, goes from top to bottom. Miguel, is it fair to say that the um, that the dependencies view is shows how individual queries are chained together, where the query plan actually breaks the query down to say how what is the actual technical execution of the retrieval of the data? Yeah, for so that it, specific query. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's all about how internally Power Query is going to evaluate that query, or how it, it estimate estimates that it's going to be evaluated. Go. Uh, cool. Um, hopefully that answered the question, Solar. Uh, we got a question from uh, from Jack uh, who asked, should we focus our learning efforts on Power Query Online first and move away from desktop? Uh, it really depends um, on you. Um, I'm I'm more of the practical approach. So if if you're going to be working on desktop, uh, it just makes sense to you know start learning on desktop. Uh, if you're going to be working on Power Query Online, uh, you can do it. Uh, from a, a vision perspective, uh, what you see in Power Query Online will land in Power BI Desktop at one point. Uh, but yeah, this this what you're seeing right now and everything in it, it is it is the future, and it's going to be available in in Excel. Should be available in Power BI Desktop and in any other tool where Power Query is. This is the standard. It's even in Excel right now. Uh, Excel for Mac that is. So that's why you see me in. And on a Mac right now, because I use uh, Power Query in Excel for Mac. You're not going to commit to any timelines and how long it'll be before we see it on Windows, though, are you? Uh, we're going to have to ask the Power BI desktop team first on that one. Uh, but uh, we're working on it. That I can tell you that they're working on on that one. Uh, timelines only by the Power BI desktop team. Well, I hope the I hope the Excel team has uh, has a similar timeline to what the Power BI desktop team does. Um, Last question that we've got in the chat right now, um, and I've left this one for last only because I think this one's a, a big bit more open ended. Uh, what type of license in Power BI do you need? So, um, Luis, I'm, I'm just going to um, sort of narrow the scope on this one a bit. I'm, I'm assuming you're saying in order to use data flows that that uh, that um, Miguel is actually showing here. But if that's not accurate, then uh, if you can. Um, can post back into the, the chat with a little more detail. That'd be great. So um, yeah, for so for data flows, what kind of a license do you need to work with data flows, Miguel? So we do have data flows in a couple of flavors. We have data flows for Power BI and we have data flows for Power Apps or the Power Platform data flows. If you're going to be going with uh, Power BI, uh, the minimum license that you're going to need is uh, Power BI Pro so that you can have access to our workspace. Because that's where the uh, the artifact where data flows actually lives. And yeah, if you have premium or premium per user, you're gonna get it um, as part of the bundle. Yeah. Perfect. I think that answers the question. Um, any other questions from uh, from people? I mean, you got to, you got access to Miguel from uh, who who was working for Microsoft on these products. So uh, so don't be shy. He loves questions. Honestly, <laughs> I didn't ask him. I didn't ask him about that first, but. Um, he uh, he always answers mine, which is always nice. But uh, if you do have questions about this stuff, I mean, please, by all means, uh, you know, take advantage of the opportunity. Fire them into the chat here. So, um, yeah, I don't see Wayne asking any questions. So that's 
I don't know. I was are, are, are you relieved or, or just surprised? Super surprised. Man. <laughs> you know, mine's going to be about when's the uh, SharePoint connector coming, Miguel. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what I can tell you is that Bob is 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 looking into that. Bob is the um, the product manager who works uh, on connectors, and so he's he's really looking into that with the team. Uh, but yeah, we, we're, we're taking that super seriously. Uh, um, and the idea is that at one point the um, SharePoint 2 implementation and 2.0 implementation should be the standard. We're just uh, yeah, finalizing, making sure that it's, it's in the right spot. The one I like in just to sort of take things off a tangent a second is if, if in data flows, if you connect to OneDrive, you do get that beautiful browse option now. Yep. In, in the data flow experience. Mm -hmm. um so yeah just adding that so is bob working on the option of getting the that to be a sharepoint option as well i cannot confirm that one yet but uh oh, okay but what i can tell you is that we are exploring that um so that that just browse OneDrive and and you know the pop-up that comes so you can actually browse yeah that's really that. good now you know that's what you'd hope and expect to see yeah so it makes it really nice and user-friendly but just so, a SharePoint version of that would be awesome. But I know you know. But yeah, no, you know, we know. <laughs> uh, we're exploring that. We're, we're working internally on on investigation of, of this one. Uh, one thing that you can do, um, and if you if anyone wants to see, is that we do have public release notes. So what you can see is um, there we go. So that integrations. Um, we work on a semester basis, so the next semester is going to start in about two and a half weeks. And it goes from October 22 to March 2023. So in here, in this uh, site, uh, Power Platform Release Plan, this is where you can actually see everything that we're going to be working on. Absolutely everything. Um, and one of the things that's going to come that, uh, you know, everyone internally is super happy about is the ability to actually load to Azure SQL databases in Dataflows. So you're going to have the ability to output your Dataflow or any of your entities directly to an Azure SQL database. And I know that you're going to like that one, Ken. So, Dude, I am so here for that. Absolutely. Yeah, so we do have other uh, plans. And yeah, you can check them out on the site. Uh, we should be updating this in the coming weeks as well with, with more items. But uh, so, this is so the site. Buddy, now that you opened up the can to say, here's what our, all of our release plans are, Christian's asking, are there any insights on why the personal query gallery was removed from the release plan and moved to next year in March? Um, yeah, we we sometimes, what we do is uh, we try to commit to something, but in the meantime, uh, while we're working on it, we realize that, yeah, maybe the way that, that we envisioned this wasn't the right way. And yeah, we, we take time to make sure that what we deliver uh, the lowest value to customers. So sometimes uh, the queries, uh, personal queries library was one of them. Uh, so we, we pushed them to, to the next semester. So we were trying to make it happen this semester, but we're going to be making it happen uh, way better for the next semester. There you go. And funny, funny enough, I'm actually the, the PM owner for that one. So I'm, I'm the one working on that now. Oh, so you're, you're, the, you're the guy to blame for it actually not being ready yet? No, I'm the guy that's picking up <laughs> things now to actually make it make it better. Man. Uh, just give me a hard time. Uh, so listen, uh, Luis has also asked a question. He said more of a general question. What's more efficient, preparing the data in SQL as far as cleaning, transforming versus doing it in Power Query outright? Uh, it's completely up to you. Um, uh, even though I'm actually in, in, in the Power Query, the product team, um, at the end of the day, it's about working with the tools that you feel most comfortable with. Power Query is a, is a tool that is more geared towards the uh, business users. So if you don't feel comfortable creating your own SQL, for example, Power Query can create that SQL for you. Uh, but in the in the most purest way, if you can do things at the data source, that is the the best way to go. If if you're yeah, the, the point where you actually have that data source that is just as clean as as it can possibly be and just ready to be consumed, that's that that's an UDP basically you, you know that's topic it's, it's it's just the desired state for anything 
can you imagine that you know the, the the database that we had for the WooCommerce orders was just clean? Ken, like that would be ideal, man. It's a fantasy. It's still not yeah. clean. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm still still dealing with that. Yeah, I mean, but honestly, I mean, you know, I I see that this is where you know. Uh, to to answer that question, Luis, I mean, from from my side here, I mean, you know, I'm a business user and I have enough SQL skills to be very, very dangerous. But, um, you know, I have Power Query skills that are extremely good. So for me, Power Query is the tool that I'm going to use. And if Miguel can bring me something where I can actually load clean data into an Azure SQL database, well, now I got the best of both worlds because I can actually use the tools that I'm familiar with, build the script, load it into a SQL database so that that is is then clean and um, ready to go for other people that don't need to run their own Power Query every time that they're actually dealing with something. Right now, every time we want to talk to that database, there's three of us that use it. Every one of us has to run a pretty heavy, you know, Power Query script to go and transform the data to get into the format that we need. So, you know, would it be better to have somebody write a big SQL script for it? Sure, but it's going to cost a bunch of money and I don't have that. So, you know, it's the, uh, it, it really comes down to, you know, what's best and what your resources dictate for your organization and who can even pick it up with the time that they have, uh, you know, because everybody's time is precious. So it depends. The standard answer for all this stuff, right? Yeah. So at the end of that, just, just choose what, what, what actually works for you. Don't, don't try to, um, yeah, it, it's whatever works for you. Uh, I do think that, Power Query does bring a lot of value, so give it a try. It might surprise you uh, the same way that it surprised us, uh, Ken and I, to the point that we uh, even wrote a book about it, you know, two books. Yeah, two it'll books change your life. life. Change your yeah. life. Um, okay, uh, April has a question. Are there any tips for speeding up queries that are linking to files like Excel that are not databases and where folding is not applicable? There are some some <laughs> things that we can do, uh, but it really depends on um, on your queries and what they're doing. Uh, what you can try to do is check if there are any um, in the query. Well, the query plan, yeah, it, it, it's more about trying to analyze how um, how you're doing things. Uh, there's really no no magic uh, button that we have to just make things faster, really. Um, in some cases, it might be that, uh, for example, um, you might be doing uh, some sort of joins or some sort of uh, referencing with itself at its own query. It might actually be reading the whole table instead of just reading, you know, parts of the table that you want to do. So there's there's a lot of that that I'm seeing. Uh, other times it might be that, um, yeah, it might be that perhaps if you're using in, in Excel, for example, uh, there might be some situations where the privacy uh, settings for some of your data sources might actually come into play, and um, those create some firewall partitions. Which, uh, yeah, it's it's imagine that it's. We partition uh, the whole mashup or your whole project or your whole file into subfiles where they can actually evaluate independently. And then once we're ready to m make the mashup or combine those uh, data sources, we do it in isolation locally because of the privacy levels. Sometimes if you, uh, you completely understand your sources, uh, perhaps turning off the privacy levels or just the firewall completely doing the fast combine might actually expedite things a little bit. Um, so it, it depends. Um, Ken can tell you more about the formula firewall if you ever encounter that one. Um, but those two are the ones that I seen the most. Not sure if you have any, any examples, Ken. I'm just going back to it depends. I mean, it depends on so many things, right? I mean, what is, uh, you know, how how big is the file? Are you using folders full of files? Are you, you know, um, what are you doing to them internally? And I mean, I, I'm going to fall back on the words of uh, Imke Feldman that, uh, you know, performance tuning in, inside the stuff is sometimes as much art as it is science. Um, it, it's a tricky one, April, without being able to see what you're doing exactly um, and, mm -hmm. and really, you know, digging into it. It's going to be tough to give you a good answer on that one. But um, generally what I would, try and do is try and minimize the amount of files that you're trying to work with 
Uh, the other thing that um, that I would uh, would consider is if you're actually trying to cons um, consolidate massive folders full of files and building up a, a massive history out of it, if you can at some point export the data that's already been cleaned and reference that in future, then you're actually only loading data rather than loading and transforming data, and then you just append new stuff to it. But it's tricky. I mean, building an incremental refresh system in Excel is, is tough, uh, but it is certainly possible. So it, it really depends. And I say you'd have to see a lot more with it. Um, Miguel Shirley's asking, uh, I use um, I use Power Query via desktop or re uh, receive regular SQL files to import to Power Query to work with. Do I need Power BI query folding and plan to be more efficient? By SQL files, do you mean, uh, Shirley, do you mean uh, um, flat files maybe or um, what exactly are, what do you mean SQL files? Could it be database files? Just waiting for an answer on that one. So query folding can help you uh, when you're connecting directly to uh, a data source that uh, does have uh, query folding capabilities. And usually if, if it has a compute engine, it is uh, more than likely. Um, Okay, so spreadsheet, yeah, spreadsheet files pulled from a central SQL server. So they're actually spreadsheets then. They're not, it's not the actual SQL itself. Yeah, usually what in those cases, if those spreadsheets or whatever you're consuming comes from another uh, source, uh, usually it will start with, hey, um, could you potentially get in touch with your IT department to see if you can get access to that source? Because if you do it that way, then you have a central point where you simply consume the data um, and could potentially leverage query folding. So if there is a chance of maybe connecting to the SQL server, uh, that will be amazing. If not, uh, then uh, yeah, you, you're you in, um, in terms of uh, query folding, you wouldn't be able to leverage that because you're only using um, SQL files. And and yeah, um, that doesn't mean that a Power Query doesn't work if you if you don't manage or leverage query folding. You can actually still run and and combine hundreds and just hundreds of gigabytes of CSV files or Excel files. Uh, one thing that I can tell you um, in terms of performance, it's usually easier to read a CSV file than it is to read an Excel file because of how it's structured. So if if you want to do a test, for example, of your data, uh, to read your data and just load it as uh, so a CSV versus an Excel file, you're going to notice that it Power Query is able to process the CSV faster. And it's the same with pretty much any other data preparation tool that when they're reading a CSV file, it's just go way faster because it's just a, a, a much more simple uh, structure of a file. So we're able to interpret it much faster and read it more from much more faster. So just to follow up, Shirley's asked the question, can uh, can spreadsheet or can um, Power Query desktop connect to a SQL server? And I, can I just uh, um, weigh in on this one here? Because this there's an I think an important thing here that, that is a caveat that you got to throw out on this one. Um, yes, Power Query desktop can connect to SQL server. Whether you use Power BI desktop or whether you use Excel, you will be able to connect to a SQL server, providing that, and I'm not 100% sure which connectors are gated by this, but if you have picked up a, um, I'm going to call it substandard SKU of Excel, the connectors may not be visible in your menus. That's the problem. So if you're trying to connect to Azure SQL, you might need to be on an enterprise level version of your office software in order to see that connector. Uh, I don't remember whether the standard SQL server shows up in that connector. Um, so if you're on office, uh, I don't know, small business premium or something like that, um, even though you'll be able to refresh those queries, they won't show up in your menu there. So, you know, that's the, the tricky part on this. So in actual fact, yes, they can connect to SQL. It's not a problem. The challenge is depending on what version of Excel you have installed, you may or may not see that menu option to do so. So. Okay. Yeah, um, I agree. Sorry, that's my bread and butter, man. I deal with this every day. <laughs> so. <laughs> I the only the only thing that I can tell you is um, if you want to try Power Query Online, it's it, it's there. 
So if you have Power BI uh, Pro or you have a, a license for uh, Power Apps, you can always try Power Query data flows on uh, sorry Power BI data flows or uh, Power Apps data flows. And you see how how fast it is for me. It might actually be super fast for you as well, Ben. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that you've got a faster server than I do, or a faster connection. The stuff that I'm working on does not have nearly that kind of performance. So I'm um, actually on my personal one, so it's not even like Microsoft or anything oh, like that. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, there you go. Fair enough. Yeah, no, I, I'm, mine is uh, mine is definitely not. It may be the data source I'm working with too, Miguel, and it may be the size <laughs> of the data I'm working with as well. So um, I don't know, but that's it's, excuses, uh, man. You gotta try, it, man. Uh, no, I have tried it. Seriously, I've spent time in there, and this is this is why I'm telling you this. I find it, I actually find it for me personally faster to develop on desktop and then copy mm -hmm. and paste my query into Dataflows because I find Dataflows too slow to work with. So, having said that, that's my experience. You should, all of you that are listening, should try this at home and see whether or not your experience is the same. And if it is, let Miguel know. So, yeah. especially if you have a Mac, uh, I mean, I, I have Excel for Mac and I can use Power Query for Mac. But yeah, it's super fun to actually use this in, in a Mac. Yo. Um, awesome. I'm not seeing that there's any other questions that have come up on this. Uh, Joseph has linked in the chat to a uh, best practices article for using Power Query, which uh, Miguel, I see you're actually a contributor to um, yep. as well. And uh, so that's a, a good document to, to have, which is basically, you know, I think probably one of the most important things right up the front on that one is, you know, make sure you choose the right connector, find a named connector in the in the system and then, you know, filter early and do expensive stuff last. But, um, you know, it's. Uh, which is the process we try and guide you through in our book, right? Yeah. So this is, you know, that I, I wrote that, that article and it was just like a, a summary of the book, basically. Uh, but if you want to go in depth into the book, it's here. Uh, so you can go into SkillWave, the training, go to the shop and and check the, the books that we have available or that, yeah, SkillWave had available. Uh, Absolutely. Five stars. Well, do we have five wow. stars in, on, on Amazon? I, I haven't actually checked lately, to be honest with you. I don't know. Um, so you're going to check it live. There you go. Yeah, man. <clears throat> Oh wow! 88. Oh, four and a half stars. Jeez, where what happened to our other half a star? Eh? Yeah, four point six. Four point six. Well, there you go. <laughs> I'll take it. There you go. Womp womp. Exactly. <laughs> there you go. Um, thank you, Shirley. I appreciate the five star rating. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, it's. Uh, I have to say, I'm my uh, my biggest regret with that book was just not getting it out earlier. But uh, holy cow, man, that was a. Uh, it was a it was a big write, wasn't it? And so much stuff changed. That was a challenge. Everything kept changing every time we went to sit down and try and do something about it. But oh uh, well, it is what it is. Yeah. The life life of an author these days. Yeah, and now I'm actually the one like making the changes for the product. Yeah, I'm I know you're, my, you're the driving the book obsolete. I know. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Fun stuff. There you go. All right. Um, uh, oh, so Luis says, I have the old book. What are the differences with the new book? Um, well, we completely rewrote the entire book from scratch. So the yeah. differences are that there's about 10 pages in the introduction that are the same. And outside of that, everything was rewritten. New chapters, some chapters removed. Uh, it's about 30% bigger than it was before. There's more pages. Um, so basically, it's a completely new book, Luis. Um, you know, some of the examples are the same data sets, but overall, the whole thing is is a completely, complete new, new book. Um, so even if you've read the old one, um, I'm going to shamelessly say that you should totally get the new one uh, because it is different. So, um, yeah, so... Yeah. There's a lot of like, for example, on the conditionals or, or like, uh, yeah, it's conditional. We recommended in the old book something like list dot contains any, for example, and uh, the new one we don't recommend that one. Uh, we uh, instead recommend like a more practical practical approach with if and other keywords like and or uh, things like that that we can leverage nowadays and some new functions that exist so make things way easier, more performant than we did before. And you know that there was a huge gap between those two books. And, and you can clearly tell that, you know, when we wrote the first one, uh, we didn't know what we actually knew on the second one. You know, it's it's interesting though. I mean, even, uh, you know, in, in the second book, there's an entire chapter on, uh, on joins um, that was not in the first book. And the reason being is because the interface to write joins 
did not exist when we had the first book. As a matter of fact, the conditional um, conditional column dialogue didn't exist when we wrote the first book, and definitely column from examples didn't exist, right? I mean, there's so many things that just weren't there. So, uh, need a monkey T-shirt? Well, listen, hey, I got to tell you. Um, so, I actually have um, behind me here. I have a monkey. So, you know, I, I figure that's uh, that, that's better than the T-shirt. Um, <laughs> but there you go. Um, so, so Phil's asking if you've changed your mind on query structures uh, because, of course, I, I did say in the uh, in the book that the way that Ken prefers to do things is this way, where we reference multiple queries, and Miguel uh, prefers to do everything all in one query. Have you changed your mind yet, buddy? Uh, no. Now, now that I'm inside, <laughs> I know understand why. Um, so it's it's all about the. Uh, the formula firewall uh, and the firewall partitions, how they actually get created. Uh, but uh, there, there, there's going to be some some changes into it so that at the end of the day, it, um, your structure uh, is going to be the best. There you sure. go. Well, I, I will tell you that when I actually saw you kick off something in data flows that required a premium um, capacity, I went, this is exactly why I do it my way because mine wouldn't. So that's uh, that's something else that that's in there. So anyway, I'm glad to hear that you're going to officially make mine the best way. That's awesome. I appreciate that. So there you go. Um, awesome. All right. Well, uh, listen, uh, folks. Um, I don't see any other new questions coming in on this one. So I think what we'll do is we'll uh, we'll wrap it up for the uh, for the night here. Um, I want to uh, I want to just remember really quick to uh, to say a big thanks to Joseph for the uh, what's new in Power BI um, you know demo on this one again. Uh, I half the time I forget to thank him at the end of the show, so I'm trying to make sure that I get that right. And I see he's still here, so there we go. Um, and uh, Miguel, huge thanks to coming along. And as I say, I mean I, I've wanted to get you on the show for uh, for ages. I'm really pleased to uh, to finally have the chance to actually get you here, and um, this has been awesome. And uh, I. I uh, I'm still hoping that one day we get to go back and do a presentation on stage again at some point in time. I miss doing those. Yeah. That'll be a, that'll be fun. So, um, yeah. Thank you. So, thank you for the invitation. I hope that you know people enjoy the the presentation. Absolutely. No, we're getting to, uh, the good comments are coming in. So that's, there you go. Fantastic. All right. Well, thanks uh, very much, folks. Um, I'm going to shut it down for tonight. We'll get the recording posted up in the next uh, 24 to 48 hours. I will definitely post and let you know in the meetup when it is live. And uh, outside of that, don't forget, we got a couple of cool meetups coming up. I'm going to be up next month with a, uh, or in a couple of weeks with a um, demo of monkey tools. And then we've got uh, Chandeep Chabra that's going to be showing us more M tricks that tie into your power query. So on that note, Thanks very much, folks. We'll see you next time.